I'll try my best not to blow any snot bubbles out if I can. Any help from it? Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of doctrines that we apply frequently here. And uh, <clears throat> one of them, as an example, is the open hand, close hand doctrine. And uh, that's, that's very basically with the closed hand, we uh, saying that, that there are some fundamentals of our faith that we will not negotiate. They're non-negotiable. Like the virgin birth of Jesus, Jesus living a perfect life and, and then a sinless life and dying on the cross for my sins uh, and was put in an empty tomb and arose on the third day and he, he walked here for a while and then he ascended into heaven to be at the right hand of the Father. We, we won't negotiate that. But then there's the open hand, and the open hand is, is uh, w you know, we'll talk about things like uh, baptism, as an example, you know. Um, some people believe that, 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 that sprinkling is just fine. Some people believe that, you know, you need to be fully immersed. I remember we, we baptized this, this pregnant lady one time, and, and she was worried that maybe... Maybe she wasn't completely baptized because her belly was <laughs> out of the water. I assure her she was. We, we, we got you covered with that one. You know, th th those kinds of things. And, and uh, what about the thief on the cross? You know, uh, he, he uh, died that day after Jesus set him up for eternity. You know, so th that's the open hand stuff. There are other things that align with the open hand that are really actually what you would consider to be in, in the gray area of the Bible. There are things that traditionally people have applied opinions to. Um, sometimes people try to make... Um, try to make rules out of these that, you know, like a list of you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, can't do that. And, and, and very basically, the Bible is not definitive on these. Like, I'll give you some examples. Is it a sin if I dance? Now, you, it would have to, it depends on who you asked. <laughs> After watching me dance, I usually dance like Pee Wee Herman, but, you know. Uh, is, it, is it a sin to smoke a cigar? Is it a, sin, uh, is it a sin to listen to other music other than Christian music? You know, I mean, uh, there is um, a lot of things that people interject into life that they feel is a, is a sin. I remember, I remember growing up, the big thing was, was uh, uh, it's a sin to smoke. And you'd hear, you know, leather lung backwoods preachers pound that pulpit and just go off on, on how horrible it is to smoke, you know. And, and I remember <laughs> we were at a little church down in Summertown. And uh, the, the, the pastor there was, was ancient to begin with. Uh, but he was still farming, and he got up, and he pounded that pulpit, I know, for a good 30 minutes or so, just on smoking tobacco. <laughs> and here's the thing. That was his cash crop. <laughs> he grew tobacco. <laughs> you know? Oh, me. And, 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 you know, back, back in, the, in the day, the, they would preach on, on uh, mixed bathing in the swimming pool and, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. But here's the thing. The Bible doesn't really differentiate on those things. Uh, here's the key. The key is it is all controlled, your actions are all controlled by your conscience. Now, your conscience, as a Christian, should be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Right? And everybody's walk is different. Everybody's journey is different. Everybody's involvement with the Holy Spirit is different. 
The Holy Spirit is one. It's the same with, with all of us. But, but there are different gifts. There are different uh, walks with, with Christ. There are all kinds of things that are different there. And so the Holy Spirit controlling your conscience also controls those things that you feel like you should be able to do. But some people get on this kick. It's about, it's about uh, being free in Christ. Well, I'm free in Christ. Uh, I, I can do whatever I want to do because I am free in Christ. And, and, and I can do it without thinking about anybody else around me because I'm free in Christ and I have liberties. And Paul is going to tell us today that, guess what? There's limits or restrictions on your liberties. And it's all about L-O-V-E, love. So let's look at the text. And then we'll get into this and, uh, and break it down. Roman, Romans, Romans, <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 8. <laughs> oh, Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13, the whole chapter. Now, concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us, there is one God the Father, from whom all things and for whom uh, we exist. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former associations with idols, eat food is really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged? If his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols, and so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when, he, when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I pray that you would open our hearts today. I pray that you would just penetrate through. And, and, and may we see the message in this. And may we apply it directly to our lives and may we grow in this, in this application. We give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first thing is this, the foundation. We're going to look at verse, uh, verses 1, verse 4, and verse 8. The Corinthians sent to Paul this letter, you know, and in this letter, the, there are three reasons why they felt like that they could do anything they wanted to in the gray area. Uh, why they could eat meat offered to idols. So the first thing is, is knowledge, verse 1. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So reason number one that they said is because we, we have all knowledge. We've, we have studied the problem and what the Bible says and and, and it doesn't forbid it, so our knowledge tells us it's okay to go do whatever we want to do. Secondly, uh, idols aren't real gods. Verse 4, therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. So, secondly, an idol isn't anything anyway. Uh, an idol is nothing, verse 4 says. So, the food really it isn't offered to a god uh, because it, it, it isn't existing anyway. 
Third, God doesn't care what we eat. Verse 8, food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. So God doesn't care what we eat. So on those three bases, if you will, we have knowledge and it is, it, it, the, these things are not forbidden according to our knowledge of the scripture. An idol isn't anything anyway. So what's the difference? And then God could care less about what we eat. So because we've come to these three reasonings, we've decided to go ahead and live it up and just eat everything. Point number two. Let's go back and unpack some of this now. Um, we all have knowledge. This is verses 1 through 3. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not know yet, um, he does not yet know as he ought to know, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. So, you know, we studied the scripture and, and it doesn't forbid it. We know that it is not forbidden. We, we, we know all of this stuff. And because of knowing all of this stuff, thinking that we have all knowledge, we're puffed up. We get puffed up in our knowledge. But here's the thing. What we don't know, we don't know. And there's a lot that we don't know. And you don't know what you think you know. And so, that, that's what he goes back and he says, look, you need to understand that it isn't enough just to know. There's got to be more. You've got to have love. And he's going to explain that to us in just a minute. You know, I, if you think you know everything in verse 2, he says, you really don't know what you ought to. And so, you have to go past knowledge and seek to display love. So you've, you've got to consider somebody else, is what Paul is looking at with this. He's, he's, he's going to take us down this road to explain to us that there are weaker Christians around us. That, that means that they're, they're not as mature, maybe, as you are. And because of that, their liberties are not what yours are. Um, you've got to take other people in effect. You have to look around and see what's going on around you and understand that you have a weaker brother or sister in Christ watching you. And believe me, they are. And so what you do, if you don't consider them, could very easily offend them. And you could position them because of your actions in such a way that their conscience is hurt. And you don't want to do that. So then you have to limit your liberties. You can't live in knowledge alone. Uh, and, and you might hear somebody say, well, you know, well, what do I care what anybody else thinks? Or, or what do I care about, uh, about them? Or what do I care about how it affects them? Or I have liberty, and I've, I've studied the Bible, and I know it's not forbidden, so I'm going to live it up, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do this thing anyway. Well, Paul says, if you do that, don't you realize that it will hurt your brother or sister because they will be offended? And it may even cause them to sin. Point number three. Idols aren't real gods. Verses four through seven. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us 
There is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge. But some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. So, Paul says, look, I, I agree with you in regard to this eating thing. You know, we, we know this. We know that, the, 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 that there is no idol. Literally, it says there is no such thing as an idol in the world. There's no such thing uh, as, as a real idol, uh, per se. In, in other words, looking at, uh, at, a, at a Buddha statue, you know, the Buddha with the big belly, you could go up and knock on his big belly and you say, hello, hello. And guess what the answer would be? Nothing, because there's nobody there. Nobody's at home. And that's what Paul is trying to say to them. You know, oh, yeah, 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 I got it. You, you think there are many gods. Um, uh, verse 5 says, for although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, uh, they're all over the place in, in this day and time. You know, according to them, they're everywhere. But to us, verse 6, there is but, what? One God. You know, Paul had preached this. And he had to agree with them. Acts chapter 19, verse 26 is an example of that. That's uh, when... Uh, in Ephesus, a, a riot broke out because of the burning of their gods and all that kind of good stuff. And they said in verse 26 of Acts 19, And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. In other words, there's nothing there. That, that's Paul's message. Nobody's at home. And that there, there are some interesting things in Psalm 115, verses 5 through 8. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their, mouth, uh, through their throat, they who make them are like unto them, which is kind of sarcastic. In other words, the people who made these idols are as dumb as the gods themselves are. <laughs> so, and, and everybody that trusts in them. Everybody that, that worships these, these dead, false idols uh, are, are, are just lost. That's, that's all I can say. So the, there's, an, there's an argument here that uh, I, I think you have to put uh, some meat to. It's, it's solid theology. Uh, they're reiterating, if you will, the, the Shema of, of Israel. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then uh, verse 6, uh, chapter 8, verse 6. This is a great statement. Yet for us there is one God, the Father from whom all things are all things, and for whom we exist. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. So that's the basic foundation of Christianity. That's the, the Christian faith, if you will. One God, the Father. Um, and that's, that's from whom everything comes to us, and from whom we exist. God comes to us, and we go back to His presence Glorifying Him is how this, this thing works. And, and, and he mentions the Lord Jesus Christ through whom uh, all things exist and through whom we exist. So he, what's happening here is God comes to us in Christ and we go back to God through Christ. And that word through is key in defining Christ. So God is the ultimate source. And Christ is the agent uh, through which all of this works. So that's a great statement. 
You know, there's nobody there anyway. There's only one God. And that settles it. And if that's the case, then um, they say, well, we're just going to go and eat up. Um, that's the argument. That's, that's a good argument. And uh, there is... <laughs> Nothing else there. Nobody at home. So Paul isn't finished. Though. Let's look at verse 7. Uh, here's his response to that reasoning. However, not all possess this knowledge. So let's stop there just for a minute. Uh, everybody doesn't yet have this knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge that idols are nothing. Now, they may have it in their heads. They may have been... Uh, taught the same basic truth, but they don't have it as an inner understanding, as something, as something that they have completely, totally embraced. Um, to, to put it uh, in a little different way, it hasn't yet been emotionally integrated into their daily living. Uh, it's something that they have in their head, but it hasn't made its way yet into their, uh, their life, if you will. And just think about it. Let's say that, let's say that there, there was a young man uh, in his late 20s, early 30s. Uh, he's lived there all this time, uh, been indoctrinated into the pagan situation going on there every day. Uh, he, he, he sees his mom, he sees his dad, he sees all the people around him. But then everywhere he goes in town, all he sees are these little, these little gods, these little idols, everywhere. Uh, lining the roads and in the temples and in their homes. And just, I mean, they're, they're just everywhere. So this, this guy now has had, let's say, 30 years of being involved with, intimate with, associated with all of these idols. And then he gets saved. And, and, and he's like, okay, you know, I'm saved, and, and I, 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 don't want to, I don't want to be around any of that vile, evil stuff, those false gods. So somebody says, well, but there's, there's no real gods there. They're, they're nothing. And he may hear that in his mind, but he's not, he's not going to be able to embrace it uh, for, for some time until he matures to the place that he can understand it. That, that, I mean, he's got to replace 30 years worth of being indoctrinated with these idols. Um, he's been intimate with them too long to just overnight immediately cut loose with it. And so that's, that's exactly what Paul is saying. Yeah, it's fine to say an idol is nothing, but not everybody understands that and embraces it yet. Not everybody can feel that. Uh, and you can, you can run up and grab something to eat from the temple if you want to, but that guy is going to go uh, because you did and take a bite, and he's going to say, hey, wait a minute. No, I, I, I just was saved out of all this. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be part of this vile, rotten, despicable idol worship. And he's going to feel guilty. He's going to feel sinful. And it's going to destroy his personality. He's going to, to, to damage his fellowship with God. So Paul is saying, don't do it. That's the point. Let's look at the rest of verse 7. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Notice the, the phrase there, association with idols. It means um, intimacy, and it means being accustomed to. So let me, let me put that together in a little bit of a different way for you. For some who are accustomed to being intimate, with an idol. Um, some people are so accustomed to being intimate in this life of devotion to idols that they, um, 
it's, it's hard for them to process this. Uh, maybe they've been saved for a little while. Maybe they're still holding on to some of those associations and trying to cut away from those. Um, they, 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 they still have this feeling, though, that there's something behind those idols. There's some kind of some kind of God or something behind those items. I mean, after all, growing up, I'm sure that this guy heard people give testimony about, about a God doing something. One of those idols doing something. Or, or maybe even somebody talking about a great catastrophe that was, was because of one of those gods or something. And, and so, you know, they automatically have that that they've got to take care of. It, all of this paganism that they have to deal with. And so, you know, you, you, can't, you can't be involved with anything around that because you don't have the maturity yet to sustain it, so you have to stay away from it. And, you know, this, this thing about conscience is, is uh, something that we need to pay attention to because the, the conscience is is extremely important in directing our lives, our daily lives. And if, the, if, if, if your conscience says, don't do that, then don't do it. But here's, here's the hard thing. If you see somebody else doing it, or if everybody else is doing it, uh, chances are you're going to feel like you can go do it. And you know what happens? Immediately, your conscience is defiled. That's what the, what the Word tells us. And What does that mean? I don't know about you, but, but there have been times that my conscience just begins to beat on me and begins to, to make me feel awful. And so this young man, uh, this young man sees what's going on and, and, and it's going to make him feel sinful. It's going to make him feel guilty. Um, it's going to make him feel condemned uh, that maybe God has failed him somehow or another. Uh, resentment toward the Christian brother who he saw doing this it creates a division in the body. It pushes him deeper into legalism and deeper into weakness and deeper into sorrow. And, and may tempt him because he can't even handle the meat, much less the pagan rituals that are going on around it. So if he gives in to the pagan rituals, then chances are he's going to fall into sin because he violated his conscience that wasn't yet mature and liberated. Paul says you're better off to let this guy live by his conscience even if it's confining. You know, better for him to avoid it altogether until he is matured. Um, knowledge says you can eat. Love says, think about how it affects those around you. you know, knowledge says an idol is nothing. Let's eat. Love says, wait, wait, I, I choose not to eat, though I can, because my brother believes it's wrong, and I'll give way to his belief until he matures and understands it. Point number four, God doesn't care what we eat, verses 8 through 12. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in, a temple's, in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged and if his conscience is weak? to eat food offered to idols. And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. So the third argument that Paul is unpacking here is, it starts off with the, the statement that food will not commend us to God. That word commend there just simply means bring us close to God. In other words, Food will not give us a closer walk with God. God could care less what you eat. Now, God, God does care if you're gluttonous. He, he does care 
if you're overindulgent. God cares if you're wasteful uh, and, and all that. But God doesn't care if you have broccoli or, or cauliflower, hot dogs, hamburgers, pizza, um, or whatever. God, God doesn't care if you eat that. There are no religious uh, uh, rules that are set into place. You know, spiritual people are not vegetarians. Praise God. <laughs> I'm so thankful for that. Amen. And so, <laughs> so you know, uh, Pastor Cliff and I love cooked cabbage. You know, I know that they're going to serve that at the marriage supper. It's just going to be there for sure. Anyway, it, 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 God doesn't care if that's what you like. Cooked cabbage, eat cooked cabbage. Um, that's not the issue. Do you remember in, in Acts chapter 10, whenever Peter was, was really struggling with things, and he saw the vision um, three times uh, on, the, on the sheet that was coming down from heaven, and finally God says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. No more dietary laws. Everything is good. Everything is okay. And Jesus said in Mark 7, uh, when he said, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of the man that defiles him. So God's provided all of it for us. Um, and it doesn't matter what we, verse 8 said. Uh, we're no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. No spiritual consequences there about what you eat. Uh, no advantage either way. Verse 9, but take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Uh, now, a, a stumbling block uh, in Scripture is viewed as an occasion to fall into sin, something, something that, that, that brings somebody around uh, to a place where they are tempted and there's a good possibility that they'll fall into sin. And so, if you, if you do these things, then it's a good chance that you're going to cause a brother or sister in Christ to fall into sin. Uh, if they don't father, follow their conscience, and, and they do this thing, they'll, they'll feel guilty and bitter and, and deeper and deeper into legalism and so forth and so forth. And, and uh, the situation becomes... One that, 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 that they can't handle. You know, maybe they shouldn't be in the, in the idol temple anyway. Maybe that's where God does not want them to go because he, they're not strong enough. They're, they're, not, they're not mature enough as you. And so you, you could go in there without sinning, but they can't. So the Holy Spirit chooses to live in this person's conscience. And, and the Holy Spirit will... Help them, guide them, direct them so that they don't uh, defile their conscience. Now, the word defile there means to, 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 to make uh, dirty, evil, uh, uh, those kinds of things. Don't force people to do those kinds of things that are wrong. In verse 10, he explains how this can happen. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple... Will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? So here, here they are walking by the, the idol temple, and, and Paul is, is saying, you know, you're the Bible scholar. You're the one that has the knowledge of, of what's going on here. Um, and, and they walk by, and they see you literally reclining at the table in the, the, the idol's temple, and they're weak, a brand new Christian, saved out of paganism. Uh, hates everything about it. They, they see you and they say, hey, look over there, there's Tim. He's, he's reclining at the table in the, in the uh, idol temple. And, and man, he's just tearing it up. He's stuffing it in. Oh, that looks so good. He can do it. This is a nice occasion. So I can do it. And he goes against his conscience. Verse 11. And so... Uh, this is important. And so by your knowledge, your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. The brother for whom Christ died. 
Now, this word destroyed is a very strong word. Uh, it doesn't mean that, that they're going to die and go to hell or anything like that. It just means that you can translate it into ruin. Uh, it ruins him. It, 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 it deflates them. It, it, it jeopardizes their walk and their faith. And um, it, it, he does it. He doesn't get the meat hardly in his mouth. He goes in and, and starts chewing it. And before he even swallows it, what happens? He wakes up to what he's doing and he feels guilty. Uh, he says, well, you know, what am I doing? I just got saved out of all this mess. I, I, I can't do this. This is tempting me. And he begins to resent you because he's, you're the one that he saw sitting in there eating. And so he, he basically moves backward instead of forward in his maturity. And you helped him with all of that. You pushed him into sin and, and he begins to resent you and resent God and everything else. So, um, that's violating his conscience because you as a more mature person with the knowledge that is required were not willing to display love, to practice love. Now, uh, God's, God has this doorkeeper, if you will, uh, called our conscience to keep us out of uh, areas uh, that we don't need to belong in. We don't need to be around. And, and as we mature, the, the conscience gradually matures. The Holy Spirit working within us with our conscience matures. And there are more and more doors that will become open because you're mature enough to handle those responsibilities without falling into sin. Without defiling your conscience. It's like a little baby at your house. Um, and I'm going over this week to watch the grandkids. Landon and Ashley are, are vacationing. Uh, Mark and Kim have had the weekend, bless their hearts. Um, and I know that I'm going to say, uh, don't go upstairs. You've got to stay in this room. Don't get out of this room. Don't touch that. It's hot. Don't pick that up. It's new. It'll break. Leave it alone. Don't jump off of the couch. Put your clothes on. <laughs> and drop that crayon. You know, I know that's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. But that's what happens here, you know. Um, it's, it's true spiritually as well, in our spirituality. It, God takes a spiritual baby, confines that baby by conscience, and little by little, as they mature, God begins to expand that conscience. And through instruction and growth, He uses them more and more and more and more. Verse 11, and so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. The brother for whom Christ died. Now here's, here's, a, uh, here's a trick question. How would you treat somebody that Jesus died to save? Think about that one for a minute. You know, how would you treat them? It's a very interesting thought. Uh, you may not agree with, with their views of life. You may not agree with what they do or don't do. Um, but he's a person, she's a person, that Christ paid a penalty on the cross for whom he shed his blood. And you ought to treat them as such. There's a, a, there's a particular kind of of dignity involved uh, in every Christian. And, and I'm, uh, I am thrilled, I am totally thrilled to limit my liberties 
uh, because of the love that I have for brothers and sisters in Christ who may be um, weaker, less mature than me. I mean, this, it, it's very eye-opening to think about some of these people that we've had encounters with and realize, you know what? Christ died for them just like he died for me. And he takes it one step further in verse 12. Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, here's a kicker, you sin against Christ. How do you sin against Christ? Because that person, that believer, that, that, that new Christian, the, the, the weaker one, is a believer who is one with Jesus Christ, following Jesus Christ. And whenever you do something to ruin them, you have sinned against Christ. Point number five. Um, I called it limit your liberties. And I got that stupid commercial locked into my brain. Liberty, 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 liberty. And I couldn't, I was sitting on the, on the couch this morning and had some hummers come up and they were, they were feeding and stuff and I got stuck on this thing. And I thought, what am I doing? I'm just sitting there watching the hummers. Liberty, liberty, liberty. <laughs> so having said all of that, Paul concludes, uh, here's, here's the principle, um, to govern the area of the gray, the, the, the doubtful things in, in, that the Bible is not definitive about. Um, in deciding on whether or not to do it, the principle is love. How is it going to affect a weaker brother or sister in Christ? Um, not the attitude of, well, I don't care. They're weak. They don't understand. You know, they've got their own problems. Uh, no, it, 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 if you sin against them, you sin against Christ. And, and would God... Uh, be pleased that, that this kind of love was displayed in the church at large. You know, holding the weaker brothers and sisters up and building them up and discipling them and helping them to mature. All right, in, in closing, and this is just a real short closing, um, Paul is going to, we're going to get soon, to a place where Paul is going to tell us things that are permissible may not be beneficial. Um, he'll deal with that soon. Just because you can do something may not mean that it's, it's good for you to go do it. And I'll give you a great example. You're free in Christ to do all kinds of stuff. You know, um... You can trim your toenails with a lawnmower, but I wouldn't recommend it. That's not something I think you need to go do, right? Uh, but you're free in Christ, you know. And so this is, this is the, the opening of the door to maturity as Christians, and it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while to digest this and to put handles on it, to look around and see what's going on in the lives of those around you, to kind of figure out where they are and... And, and where you are and all this kind of good stuff. It, it, but it's, it's going to be good, and it's going to move us forward as a church. You know, um, I can't, I can't and, and will not bind somebody else's conscience by mine. That's just unfair. That, that's, that's not any good. What I have to do is I have to look and see where their conscience is, see where their maturity is, and then abide by that. Live with them at that level, right? At that level. Um, you'll have to apply this um, to, to your own life, but uh, here's, here's the thing. Um, ask the Holy Spirit to lead you in applying this to your life. You know, we must live as Christ did and, and embrace those around us um, and, and, and not, uh, not put them down or, 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 or not expect them to live outside of their 
comfort zone in, in, with their conscience. It's a good chapter. It's a good chapter, and I'm looking forward to next week as well. Let's bow our heads and we'll have a song of response. Father God, we just love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come and, and to share uh, your word. And Father, I just pray that you would, uh, that you would touch us in a very special way as we begin to now apply this to our lives. We praise your name for everything that is accomplished. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.